All right. If you would, please remain standing as we repeat 2 Chronicles 7, 14. And my people who are called by my name, humble themselves, grace and seek my face, and turn from their evil ways, then I will hear from them, forgive their sin, and heal their land. Thank you. Now to the pledge to the Bible. I pledge allegiance to the Bible, God's holy word. I will make a lamb to my feet and a lion to my path, and I will hide his words in my heart that I might not sin against God. Thank you. I pledge the American flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. And the last one, pledge to the Christian flag. I pledge allegiance to the Christian flag and to the Savior for whose kingdom it stands, one Savior, crucified, risen, and coming again, with life and with liberty to all who believe. Thank you all. You may be seated. Ms. Carey, if you would, please lead us in a prayer for our country, for our leaders, and for our churches. <coughs> We continue our, our series in Luke chapter 14, starting in verse 25, going all the way to 33. You have to remember wherever Jesus goes, he draws a crowd. So even at the dinner, I'm sure there is a huge crowd that is around him. And we have looked at the motivation for inviting him to this dinner. We've looked at Jesus trying to explain humility to those who don't have humility, the Pharisees at that time. Last week we talked about hollow Christians. And we talked about the seriousness about the invitation of salvation. Well, this week... Jesus takes a serious turn about discipleship. He wants to make sure that they understand the seriousness of saying that you're a disciple of Jesus Christ and what that truly means versus just mouthing it. And Jesus, throughout Scripture in the New Testament, always warns us that there will be a cost to serve him. There will always be a cost to serve him. So he takes his opportunity with the crowds there and the Pharisees there and he wants to talk to them about the seriousness of discipleship. And I really want you to understand as well there is a seriousness involved when you accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and you say you're a believer. That only comes through the fruition of the fruit that you bear. And that fruit is going to cost you something. You're going to have to embrace sacrifice. You're going to have to withstand a world that don't want to know about Jesus Christ. You're going to have to stand for the truth when society is trying to push and mold Christianity into something that they can tolerate instead of what the truth means. There is quite a bit of information that we're going to talk about. So open your Bibles to Luke chapter 14, starting in verse 25, and we're going to look at the call stone discipleship. Reading verses 25 through 27, it says, Now great crowds were traveling with him. So he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father or mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own wife, he cannot be my disciple." Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. I think that is perfectly clear. When I read this and when I tried to grasp the whole, the whole of this when I was a younger Christian, I likened it unto the scales of life. You know those balanced scales that's got the two dishes on each side and if you put a weight on one side it lifts the other. Y'all know what I'm talking about. 
Well, I liken that unto this. This is the scales of life, and God must always win. You have to understand that there must be a separation in your life between worldly ties, material things, and self-interest, separated from service to God. Because if a disciple of Jesus Christ don't separate the two, this side will always drag service to Christ away from you. So you have to compartmentalize everything else. You have to say, okay, worldly ties and things I have to do, loved ones, relationships, uh, material things, everything is on this side versus this side of the scale, which is my service to God. Always remember when God demands service from us as a disciple, that the skills must always tip on the side of service to God. And that's what Jesus is saying here. You have to understand, Jesus is saying here, you have to understand, I am more important than your father and your mother. I'm more important than your wife and your children. I'm more important, even more important than your own life. And if you really think about it, isn't that true? If you really look at the skills, everything that's on this side of the skills is going to disappear. Materialism will disappear. After you pass away, you won't care what happens to this stuff over here. But this is eternity. This is where you will care when judgment comes. And you are judged on how good of a disciple you are. So the first thing I want you to know is that you have to learn to separate the two. And then everyone, including your wife, has to understand that God is first. And there will be times in training that it does put a little friction just for human nature in the beginning. But in time they will understand that your walk is true. So, being a disciple of Jesus Christ in these two verses, you could basically say that sometimes the walk of a true disciple is painful. It is costly. And it is necessary. Luke 9.23 says, Then he said to them all, If anyone wants to come with me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Second time in two chapters here, he is making sure that they understand the cost of discipleship. A true discipleship requires self-denial. The cross was the most painful way to die at that time. And to take up a cross daily is to expect painful situations every day because of an allegiance that you have to Christ. Expect to embrace sacrifice. Now I'm here to tell you today, if you look back on your walk for the last couple of months, or even when you go back a couple of years, and you look for those times where you really paid the price to serve God, the sacrifice that it took, whatever it was from, materialistic things, or it was from worldly tides, or whatever it may be, see if you can pick out the times when there was cost involved in serving Jesus Christ in your life. Now, if you can't, then maybe, just maybe, you ought to take a look at your life and see if you've avoided that path because you didn't want to pay that cost. Or maybe, just maybe, your knowledge of Jesus Christ is so inadequate God can't use you. Either one is a bad situation for your walk. Amen? Amen. Jesus warns us in John 15, 20 that we should expect persecution when we follow him. It doesn't get much clearer than that. If you're a true disciple of Jesus Christ, you will embrace sacrifice. You will pay a price. There will be a cost in service. That cost may be personal time. That might cost might be a financial price. That cost might be a, a, your gifts and your sacrifices that you do. For ministries, the cost may be a ministry. But I have found out one thing in life as the clock ticks by. And then God rewards success to ministries 
when it is truly given 100% in those ministries. Failure usually comes from those that are not willing to give. Everything that Jesus did for three years in his public ministry, if you read the New Testament, if you're a student of the Word, everything that he did, all the healings that he did, all the bringing people back to life, all the wonderful advice, all the, that would absolutely mean nothing if he did not go to the cross. And in the Garden of Gethsemane, we have a wonderful picture of him embracing the sacrifice that must be. Just as Jesus warns us, he also has given us the, problem, the power to prevail in witnessing in the ministry. So I don't want you to make a mistake and understand, well, okay, if I just embrace the cost. You have to understand if you're willing to embrace the sacrifice, he's willing to give you the power to be successful. If you're willing to be a true disciple of, of his, he's willing to help you get through it. So many Christians today, and if we're honest, there might be a few in here as well. We're not willing to give 100%. We're willing to give 50%. We're willing to give 60%. Maybe even up to 76%. Some people are only willing to give 10%. But if you're not willing to be all in in Christ, how can you expect Him to be all in in you? Second point you'll find in verses 28 through 33. For which of you, wanting to build a tower, doesn't first sit down and calculate the cost to see if there is enough to complete it? Otherwise, after he has laid the foundation and can't finish it, all the onlookers will begin to make fun of him, saying, the man, this man started to build and wasn't able to finish or what king is going to go to war against another king, not willing to first sit down and decide if he is able with, with 10,000 to oppose the one who comes against him with 20,000? If not, while the other is still far off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. Stop there for just a minute. Now let's go ahead and read it. In the same way, therefore, Every one of you who does not say goodbye to all his possessions cannot be my disciple. Luke 14, 33. In the same way, therefore, every one of you who does not say goodbye to all his possessions can't be my disciple. It's pretty clear. There needs to be a separation in your life. That separation that we just talked about. If you're not willing to sacrifice everything and give him all, <clears throat> then you can't be a true disciple. We have to change our way of thinking about being a Christian. Dappling in Christianity is not enough. We must be all in. There has to be a separation from materialistic things. Let's take a look at this verse again. For which of you wanting to build a tower doesn't first set down and calculate the cost to see if he has enough to complete it. Otherwise, after he had laid the foundation, he cannot finish it, and all the onlookers will, grip, will begin to make fun of him, saying this man started to build and wasn't able to finish. Jesus is trying to teach every one of his disciples, and pay attention because this is important. He's trying to teach every one of his disciples that there must be a caring enough in your walk to spend time in planning your walk. There must be a calculation of the cost. Now, I want you to understand, and I'm going to say it two or three times, the calculation of the cost is not to see if you truly want to do it or not, because that's not your choice to make. 
you might as well figure if God's called you to that ministry, you're going to do it. The calculation of the cost of that ministry is so that you don't get surprised and run out of faith before you finish it. There has been many of a Christian that believes that God is calling them to do something, but they have spent no time in prayer, no time in planning, no time in seeking wise counsel to, to calculate the cost. If I'm going to do this and I'm going to make a stand, we're just going to pick one, um, in a ministry. And if I do this publicly, I've got family members that think the other way. They're not going to really like that. It's going to come a, a rub between those family members. And if I continue to do that, then I'm going to get in that, and alienated at work because of what I'm going to do. And you sit down and you calculate this all up. Why does God want you to do that? So that you take the time to understand the path that you're about to take. So there's no surprises about the cost that you're about to pay. Embracing the sacrifice to walk that path. It is not so that you can decide if you're going to walk that path or not. That's not your choice anymore. That's the master's choice. Say amen. Amen. Okay, I'm just checking. So you need to calculate the cost and understand that it's coming. He doesn't want you to be blindsided for several reasons. And one of those reasons is that you can build your faith, you can build your walk to the point where it's successful. The other reason is, is he doesn't want you running out of faith halfway through and decide to change your mind. Why? Because then that is a bad testimony for him. If you're going to get up and say, God has told me to do this, this is the ministry that must be done, he has given me this, and you walk the path about halfway, and then all of a sudden you don't want to pay the cost anymore because you didn't plan it, you didn't by, by prayer or by faith, Decide that you're not going to finish it. I'm just done. I turn around and I walk away. The one with the black eye. The one that you love the most in the, the entire world. Jesus gets a black eye. Because you're witnessing that he doesn't have the ability to do what he wanted you to do. Y'all understand what I'm talking about? And it also damages your ability to be his disciple and doing this again. So Jesus is telling y'all, I call you to a ministry. I want you to pray about that ministry. I call you to a ministry. I want you to calculate the cost. I call you to that ministry. I want you to ask, seek wisdom from other brothers and sisters in Christ. I want you to play it out. Not because you get to decide if you get to do it or not, but so that you decide that you will embrace the sacrifice and pay the price to make that ministry work. People that are all in are not committed, that are not all in are not committed, usually stumble and fall. The true condition for a disciple is total conscious commitment. Period. No buts, no howevers, no whatevers. Period. You must understand that you have surrendered your will to a master for the training, for the gift of salvation. Amen. Often people, I hear people say that it's a free gift. It doesn't cost you anything. I don't agree with that. I think it costs you everything that you know. But I do also think that you're going to find out you paid absolutely nothing for it. All you're giving up is your sin and your filthy rags. There is a master to answer to if you're a child of God. That master should take precedence over everything else. Amen. That master deserves a total commitment of your life.
To me, it is a privilege to call him my master. And it is a privilege to devote 40 years of my life to him. And I will tell you, there is a lot of suffering. There is a lot of cost to pay. But it is worth it. Nothing before Jesus should be the disciples of the bride of Christ. Nothing before Jesus. We should hold on loosely to the material things of this world. Now why wouldn't we? Why wouldn't we be willing to sacrifice those things when it's the blessings that your master gave you to give them to? And cannot the master who loves you because you're totally committed give you double what you're about to lose? If it be his will. The first commandment is for us to have no other gods before him. This makes God's stance clear on the subject of master disciple. And although he has the ability to have a mindset to lord over us and make us a slave, he calls us friend instead. You cannot serve Jesus Christ and keep control of your life. It is impossible. And if you think you're doing that now, then you're not a disciple of Jesus Christ. You cannot serve the Master and keep a controlling share of your life. It doesn't work that way. You do not co-pilot your life. You do not have an input of your life. It belongs to the Master. There is no let's make a deal. There is no prove it or, and then I'll do it. That doesn't work. Prove it and I'll do it is not part of it. Name and claim it is not part of it. Yes, Lord, is the only true answer when serving Jesus Christ. Your life belongs to the Master. And the Master is telling you that there will be cost in your life and that you need to embrace the sacrifice. And no one should be more important than Him if you're truly going to be a servant of the Lord. The Pharisees in those days, they didn't experience the cost. They mouthed that they were religious men of God, but in those days, they didn't experience any cost. So it was easy for them to say that they were believers, but very hard to prove it. The cost is what makes things real. Let me explain what I'm saying to you. Y'all ready? Hey. This is good stuff. You can't claim it, but it's really good stuff. The moment you knew God was real in your life is the moment you were on your knees, bawling your eyes out, asking Him to save your soul from eternity in heaven. Because of the cost that you was willing to pay, there is never a time in life that is more real to you than that time that God is real. Understand? That's why a true disciple of Jesus Christ will never forget their salvation story. They will always remember it. As life goes on, it dulls our senses in our walk. We sort of lose connection that God is real. Life goes on, busyness goes on, and all of a sudden the scales tip in, in the side of uh, worldly ties instead of service to God, and, and this gets dull, and it, and, it, and it gets to the point where it's sort of pushed in the back of our minds and we don't see God as real. Do you know how God makes it real for you again to give you the faith to move on? It's the time you have to pay something for it. 
It's the time that you have to go through and embrace sacrifice. It's the time when you go and you pay the cost, the slings and arrows and the fiery darts to serve. It's the time when you are suffering and God pulls you out of the fire. God is no longer an illusion. He's real in your life again. It's often been said you can't have a testimony without a test. And this is the part. We need to remember that God is real. We got a feeling, we got a seeing, we got a smell, we got a touching. And the only way we do that is when He yanks us out of a despairing point in our life and provides a way. We don't forget that, do we? We don't forget the time when we were suffering at the table and the finances did not match up. And we don't know what we're going to do and all of a sudden money comes to you. We don't forget those times, do we? Because those are times that God shows you that He's real. Those are the times that God snatches victory out of the jaws of defeat. And that is the time that we understand whom we serve. And there's not a time any stronger than those times that we praise our God. Cost in our lives makes it real to us. Amen. If you didn't have to embrace sacrifice, if you didn't have to suffer for the name of Jesus Christ, it would not be real to you. And Jesus is telling them this. That's what Jesus says. You've got to calculate the cost. You've got to understand. You've got to pray. You've got to do your labor work, you've got to do your research on what I'm about to send you on, and then you have to prepare for that. Because you're going to go, that's not your choice, but your choice is if you're willing to be all in on it. And if you are, I'll show you I'm real again. That brings us to a third point, and that's verses 34 and 35. Now salt is good, but if salt should lose its taste, how will it be made salty? It isn't fit for the soil or for the manure pile. They throw it out. Anyone who has ears to hear should listen. That's probably the best advice of this whole sermon. Anyone that has ears should listen. Brings us to our third point, and that's our state of mind. Romans 12, 1 and 2. It says, Therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, I urge you to present your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is our spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may discern what is good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. I don't know if you noticed those last two words, but it's not the perfect will of you. It's the perfect will of God. You don't calculate in that verse at all. And if Paul would have calculated himself in that verse, you wouldn't have everything that you have now. To decide the perfect will of God is to serve Him. When you become a disciple, things change in life. Priorities differ. Decisions now glorify Christ, not you. Paul states it best in Philippians 3.8. Love this verse. More than that, I also consider everything to be a loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ. Jesus, my Lord. Because of him, I have suffered the loss of all things and considered them filth so that I may get, gain Christ. Paul was an excellent about separating his life. And he makes it understood. Yeah, I've lost things. But it's filth compared to knowing my God. Comparing knowing that my God is real by paying the cost that I pay. The rest of that is useless to me. I want that feeling of knowing that he is real. 
Can you think back during your salvation and when you gave your life to the Lord? There was never a more uplifting point in life for me. Never a more lighter feeling and excitement because I knew He was real. I got a hold of Him. I wouldn't trade everything I have for that feeling. Paul separated the two compartments of life. And with that state of mind, Paul was able to do what his master, Jesus Christ, desired of him. Write three quarters of the New Testament. Start churches along the way. Spread the good news of Jesus Christ throughout everywhere. Be the apostle of the Gentiles, ushering them into the salvation. Shipwrecked twice, stoned, beaten within an inch of his life, in prison, And he just kept going. Until they beheaded him. He was all in. And the only way we can serve God properly today. You need these three points. Y'all need to write this down. Record it. Look it up later. Whatever you got to do. But you need these three points to serve. Ready? Ready. Embrace your salvation story. No. That God is real in your life. That's number one. Two. When you are called by the master. There must be planning. Praying. And preparation about the cost. For the commitment that you're about to make. Not if you should do it. But that you understand that you're going to get it. And then three, separate your life, the materialistic life, the worldly tie life, from your spiritual life, and make sure God wins. The question is, do you belong to Jesus Christ or not? The question is, are you willing to serve him at 100% or are you not? And if you're not, it's okay. But don't fool yourself. Okay? That's all I'm saying. Because God would want you to know where you stand. He don't want you deceiving yourself with false righteousness and then end up going to hell. Understand what it takes to serve God and then make a conscious commitment to do that. Plenty of ways to do that. Come see me, come see Pastor Glenn, and we will get you started. We will help put the tools in your toolbox, but you really got to want it. Sunday school, studying scripture, fellowship, discipleship, iron sharpens iron, wise counsel, all these things are necessary. To get you to the point where you can be 100% to serve Jesus Christ. I know Christians that have been Christians for 50 years and they're still babes in Christ. Not willing to sacrifice. you got to wonder. Is it that they're just that ignorant about what scripture says? Or are they true Christians? And if they're not... They're fooling themselves and they're about to go to hell. Can't have that. <clears throat> so, Jesus was teaching the crowds and he was teaching the Pharisees that there is a true, real cost in service to the Master. And you really need to make up your mind if that's what you want. Bow your heads with me. If you're here today or you're watching us by video and you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you can change that. All you have to do is say this prayer. You don't have to say it out loud, but you do have to mean it. Lord, forgive me of my sins. I'm lost and I need you in my life. Replace my will with yours and I will follow you for an eternity. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. With every head still bowed and every eye still closed. If you said that prayer through our video ministry, welcome to the family of God. We invite you to come here to Shining Light Baptist Church. The address is on the screen. And tell us about that decision so that we can help you start your path as a disciple. If you have a home church or a church you're comfortable in, 
then we encourage you to go to that pastor and tell them about the choice you just made. So they can start you on your path. If you're here today and you said that prayer, if you're not sure if you died today that you would go to heaven, if you don't have security in your choice as a disciple, any of those things, if you just raise your head and look up at me and I'm going to ask you three questions. Will there be more? Amen. Just keep looking at me. Will there be another? I'm going to ask you three questions. Did you say that prayer today and mean it? Are you ashamed of what Jesus has just done for you? In a minute, we're going to give the invitation. Scripture is clear that we need to make a public pronouncement of faith. The invitation is for that time. I promise you we won't eat you and that you'll live, leave here happier than you can. You think you can come down and do that for us? Okay. If it's a health issue, let us know. We'll send someone to you. Maybe you've lost the ability to find the last time it cost you to serve the Lord. Maybe it's an attachment to uh, a non-growth issue. Maybe it's an attachment of, of a sin issue. Whatever it may be, this altar is open for you as well. And I truly desire someone to come pray with you or that you would come down and pray with someone because we need to face that. Raising your hand will face that, but we need to put that away and take care of that for you. So if you, if you are having a desire for that, if it has affected you, just raise your hand for me and we will send a prayer warrior to you. All right. If you're able, the altar is open for you as well. To my left, your right, there will be prayer warriors standing by to help you. My right, your left, there is a spot to deal with these things with God alone. Whichever God is leading you to do. Our job here at Shining Light is to make you walk better, stronger when you leave than when it was when you came in. Know that you're all loved. I need one counselor, male counselor, please. All right, you may stand up. Brother Barry, lead us, if you would.